My name is David, and this video is an entirely code-free explanation of how I created a maze-solving program in Python, the results of which you can see here. This video is aimed at programmers and non-programmers alike. My focus is on communicating my problem-solving process in a tangible way that can be used anywhere, as well as algorithm formulation. And this concludes with a problem-solving technique that can help anyone solve any problem. First, I'll explain how the program works straightforwardly, and then go through the creative process that led to it followed by the algorithm itself in much greater detail, and lastly, some discussion such as lessons learned and mistakes made. You can find the code for this program on my GitHub through the link in the video description. The maze solver works using an iterative search process that proceeds in a stepwise fashion. What that means is that as the program proceeds, the locations that have been previously explored are held in memory and used to determine where to go next. I call these stamps because you can imagine if you were solving a monstrous maze by hand, you might have a small stamp you could use to mark where you've been. Each stamp in memory has its coordinates and its parent, the one that represents the step previously taken to reach it. In each iteration, the stamp nearest to the end of the maze is selected for exploration, and steps are made outwards in various directions, generating new, unexplored stamps. If attempting to make a step hits a wall, then that stamp is not made. This is the essence of the process that proceeds until the end of the maze has been reached, at which point the stamps are traced back by following the chain of parent stamps so as to identify the successful pathway through the maze. That is a very condensed explanation for this program, and so now, for the rest of the video, we'll get into the weeds with it. I think the best place to start is with the problem statement, and we'll go from there. At the worst, we could say the problem statement is solve a maze. That doesn't help with coding though because it's too abstract. The statement is too compressed. The words being used are not refined enough to point to a solution in the context of computer programming. So instead we can dig down and say, Find a path to move through a maze from the start point to the end point. Now we can shed more light on the sub-objectives and what they might entail in the context of computer programming. There are a few key words in this problem statement that merit further consideration. In the order they appear, they are the path, move, maze, and the notable points. Each of these words represents a particular question or challenge that has to be addressed. Like what will a final solution path look like? How will it be represented? How does movement happen exactly in the context of seeking out a new path? What is the environment in which these questions are being asked? That is to say, how do we define a maze and how does our program interact with and transform that maze? To address all of these things, we can begin to construct a goal tree. We'll use it to break down the problem as we go along. I think to dig deep into the problem, the maze is the first keyword that we have to investigate. When I hear maze, I think of a bird's eye view of a grid that has straight perpendicular walls and pathways, colored black and white respectively. But that isn't a sufficiently distinct conceptualization to begin to tackle the problem. To make the program, we have to clearly define the acceptable input for what a maze is and define the constraints that bound that. For example, is it an image like I described earlier? If so, what file format? What's the total size? What's the size of the pathways and the walls? What are the shapes of the pathways? You can imagine that a program designed to solve a rectilinear grid maze might have trouble or fail to solve a maze with curved pathways. So we have to consider these things at the ground level of the problem to be solved. Another question could be, what are the colors? So those are some of the main ideas around considering a maze as an image input to the computer program. One thing I think is very important to consider is the question of whether or not a maze comes in an image format at all, but rather in a graph format. For those who are not familiar, in the context of computer science, a graph refers to a representation of a network of connected nodes. Graphs are foundational to things like social networks. In that context, every individual is a node, with lines called edges connecting them to other people they're following or are friends with. This is relevant here because we can also think of a maze as a graph, where each intersection of pathways is a node, and the pathways themselves are the edges. For example, take this maze. We can sketch the pathways out and identify anywhere that multiple pathways intersect, which will make for a node. Connecting the nodes through the pathways, we construct the edges. So what we've done here is create a different representation of what is fundamentally the exact same maze. It's almost as if we're able to cut the maze along all of the black boundary lines, and then spread those pathways out in different directions, like a tree's branches, instead of having them bend around each other and be all squished into a square. This shows the power that a different representation can have. In the visual format, the bends and possibly curves in a maze can make it more difficult or confusing to solve whereas in a graph format, we eliminate those. In some cases, the difficulty in completing a maze can simply be an artifact of the difficulty that your eyes have in following and recalling a pathway when paths are all in parallel or if they are circuitous. As I mentioned, graphs are a huge topic in computer science, and there are many mature techniques and methods for highly efficient graph searches and the like. 
those existing methods would make solving a maze in graph format very easy. Moving forward, we will consider representations of mazes as graphs, as well as mazes as images, since this sets the stage for how to develop our solution. With these different representations of mazes in mind, we have to decide what to work on to proceed with the problem statement. Since we're at the very outset of the project, I arbitrarily decided on what I wanted to do, which was to make a program that worked under these conditions. For the file input, we would have an image file with RGB colored format of a bird's eye view of a maze. The size would be unconstrained, as would be the pathway size and the pathway shape. Lastly, the colors would have to be black and white, with black boundaries and white pathways. While working on a maze as graph representation would be easy, it would be useless to have a program that does that because you'll never find a maze given to you as a graph of its pathways. It's always in image format, so that's what the program has to handle. I wanted the program to work on interesting and fun mazes that you see sometimes, not just rectangular mazes, and so this lack of constraint on path type and curvature demanded a variety of considerations later on in the process, which we'll see. Having restricted the space of possible mazes we want the program to handle, we can proceed to look at the other parts of the problem statement. We can look at the path next, since the path is what we want to create by moving, so we need to know what we want before we determine what tool to use. In a graph context of a maze, a path would simply be a list of nodes that are connected to each other, in the sequence of their connections. But since we're working on images of mazes, we have to think of a path from one spot to another in the maze as a series of continuously connected pixels in which every pixel is white or whatever the path color is. In fact, this sets up the perspective of an image as a graph, where every pixel is a node connected only to its neighbors. We could think of this as a super large graph, where each white pixel is connected to every other white pixel, which is obviously hugely cumbersome and inefficient to work with as compared to the ideal type of graph we sketched out earlier. In a graph like that, there would be many, many pathways from any given point to another. That's a problem because then no matter how smart your search or movement methodology, you're going to be doing a whole lot of redundant processing of a multitude of paths that are essentially the same. That kind of program wouldn't be a viable solution, so we'll tackle that problem momentarily. But in any case, these are the conceptualizations of a path in graph and pixel space, and again the latter of which can be considered as a big ugly graph. Having a more crisp idea of the path we need, I think the next most important point from the problem statement to consider is the question of movement. First and foremost is the question of what moving actually means. By what means is that performed? Most of the time we might solve a maze on paper where movement just means sketching a line across the page, but even such a simple concept as that isn't something that is translated to a computer in a one-to-one -one manner. Second is the matter of strategy or logic. While random movement through the maze would eventually find a solution, we naturally have some expectation of efficiency, so there needs to be a method to the madness in the search. As with most things in life, I would say that the strategy here could be said to be dependent on the means, so we address those first. On a graph representation of a maze, the idea of moving around in the graph would simply be that your attention or position could only ever shift from a given node to another one that is connected to. Looking at a pixel-based image of a maze, movement necessarily entails movement from one pixel to another on the basis of the pixel color to generate paths that do not cross maze bounds. As mentioned previously, a lot of methods exist for graph search, and so we might consider, what if we turn the pixel representation into a graph representation just as we did by hand earlier in the video? Perhaps you would disagree, but I had to forgo this option because of the complexity of the problem. I simply could not think of a means to convert the given image into a perfectly non-redundant graphical representation of the same maze, with the process being reasonably efficient. That conversion essentially reverts to a pixel search problem, so that is the one we'll tackle. Unfortunately, images that we might consider as having decent resolution often have millions upon millions of pixels, making pixel-wise search essentially infeasible on the basis of computational intensity. At this point, I decided to proceed using a step search as the primary method. The idea is that instead of exploring every single pixel, the search would move by taking larger steps into new regions, with the straight line of pixels from the origin to the destination of a step being checked to ensure that the maze boundaries are not crossed. Furthermore, before being made, a check is made to ensure that the step destination is not within a step radius of another step that has been made. This enforcement of non-overlapping step zones has two desirable properties. The first is redundancy elimination. The second is no backtracking, and the third is easy traceability. While a person easily identifies a pathway when going through a maze, a naive pixel search program could waste loads of time by winding around in wavy paths that a person would simply cut through with a straight line, making the program non-viable. By creating no-go zones around points where search steps have already been made, the program effectively prevents wasting time through highly redundant search within a path. Backtracking is when the search algorithm would find itself turning around and attempting to search a region that it has already been to. That could lead to loads of wasted time. 
The caveat to these benefits is that for them to apply, the no-go zone around steps should be around the same size as the width of the path through the maze. When visualizing no-go zones as being colored in, a maze that is a work in progress might appear as if a real person is solving it by using a circular stamp to mark the places they've been, which led me to refer to the points being searched as stamps instead of steps. The last benefit of the step or stamp search methodology, traceability, refers to the fact that once a search stamp has been made, which has reached the end of the maze, the stamp search method provides an easy way to trace that successful solution pathway back to the beginning of the maze. That can be accomplished by storing each stamp taken in memory and associating that stamp with the one that came before it. Following the chain of stamps creates a chain connecting the start of the maze to the end. Being in the step search paradigm, the questions of the step size and stepping direction remain to be solved. These are determined jointly depending on the method. I identified three methods to determine the step size and directions, but feel free to comment if you could think of additional methods. These are the first, max step size, the second, fixed step size, and the third, dynamic step size. In the final version of the program, I use dynamic step size for the reasons we're about to see. The max step size method refers to the idea of performing a radial search and identifying the nearest boundary in every direction from the originating position. The benefit of this method would be that it would facilitate skipping over large swaths of empty space in a maze, such as long straight paths or large empty spaces that might appear in aesthetically designed mazes. One problem, though, would be the matter of efficiency. If the radial search were performed at some angular increment, then every point that was observed would be discontinuous from the others, which would leave a lot of unanswered questions as to whether or not the gaps observed are new pathways that merit exploration, or whether there are continuous walls that are of no further interest. To avoid that, a continuous radial sweep could be used to positively identify observable discontinuous points in the boundary, but that would be very computationally intensive, with lots of redundant pixel checking. Furthermore, identifying the boundary pixels doesn't indicate how the path itself should be saved or selected, since the data to be saved must relate to the pathway pixels or markers, and following straight rays would create the smaller issue of having an ugly, jagged path. If you disagree, feel free to let me know, but it seems to me that implementing this technique would effectively entail redrawing the entire boundary region of the maze pixel by pixel, which would be a huge undertaking for large images. Lastly, given that a step in any direction would always be taken at the maximum size, it isn't immediately obvious how backtracking could be prevented, using the no-go zone method mentioned before. All these reasons coming together made my instincts point me away from this solution method. The fixed step size method felt better to me. The idea would be that steps of some fixed pixel size would be taken, and that size could also be used for no-go zones. With respect to directions, it makes sense to check the four cardinal directions first, since that's the most easy way to do programmatically as pixels are arranged in rows and columns. And if a step can be made in those directions, then the overlapping no-go zones from those four steps preclude the need to attempt to explore in oblique directions. If any of the explorations in cardinal directions fail due to hitting a boundary or going into a no-go zone, then the angular region around that cardinal direction can be iteratively checked for the possibility of being a valid exploration step. The problem with the fixed step size method is that it would be very inefficient for mazes with widely varying pathway widths. Since the fixed size would have to accommodate the narrowest path in any given maze, it is forced to inefficiently make many redundant stamps in wider pathways, slowing down the computation and cluttering the outcome. For this reason, the final version of the program uses dynamic stamp sizes, meaning that the size of the step taken changes depending upon the region within which a step is being taken. To begin, the image is segmented into a grid of different step size zones. Then each pixel of the image is scanned and the size of all pathways are measured in every row and column of pixels and the sizes of those gaps are stored in a tally for each zone. After performing this task, a fixed step and stamp size is assigned to each zone, which corresponds to the most frequent gap size observed in that zone. So in this way, the dynamic step size method is really just static step sizes for smaller distinct zones of the maze. This method is paired with direction determination described previously for the fixed step size method. While this process is pretty slow and intensive because it goes through every single pixel in the image, I felt that this was an acceptable trade-off for the flexibility provided, since a pixel-wise scan of the image was already being taken for a different purpose, which is the last item of the problem statement, the notable point. The program uses color coding to automatically detect the start and end regions of the maze. It performs a pixel-wise search and scan of the image to seek out any pixels of the relevant colors, and marks the center of the colored clump as the start or end point respectively. Since a single pixel-wise scan could be used to complete both of these startup functions, the step size determination and locating the start and end points, I felt that that inefficient process in itself was a suitable price to pay for the functionality. The only other option I could think of to allow the program to work for any maze would be to have the user input the coordinates of the start and end points. 
but I felt that that would be less desirable for the user than to color in the start and end. Finally, returning to the problem of movement, the strategy for movement remains to be determined. Googling pathfinding algorithms reveals a wealth of prior work in that area, and researching some of that led me to the following list of options. The nearest to end heuristic, the A star algorithm, and Dijkstra's algorithm. The context for the application of these strategies is as follows. At any given point in the search process, there are going to be some stamps which have been made but have never been considered as the active stamp. All of these childless stamps are stored in a set. In any given new iteration, these are the candidates to be selected from for further stepping and exploration to proceed from them. The first strategy, nearest to end, selects the stamp that has the shortest straight line distance to the finish line, as the name suggests. This strategy is simple, though if the correct route is not direct, then it can lead to a lot of incorrect searching, such as can be seen in the snails on planks example maze and the Asian architecture example maze. The A star algorithm adds a layer of nuance to the nearest to end strategy. Instead of selecting only on the basis of distance to the finish, the algorithm selects the stamp which has the shortest distance x, where x is the sum of the distance already traveled and the straight line distance to the ending. The benefit of this method is that in the event that a false candidate pathway leads directly to the end of the maze but then winds around unsuccessfully, this algorithm will alternately return efforts to the untested candidate pathways, which has previously been abandoned near the starting point. This algorithm is guaranteed to provide the best solution first. The last candidate strategy I identified was Dijkstra's algorithm. Where the A star algorithm considered distance traveled as well as the estimated distance remaining, Dijkstra's algorithm considers only the distance that has already been traveled, meaning it always selects the stamp that's nearest to the start as a search candidate. While this ensures that the solution discovered is indeed the shortest path, the process itself leads to a lot of false leads as it continuously expands all search opportunities in a circular fashion outwards from the start point. Looking at these three candidates for the movement strategy, I decided to implement the nearest to end heuristic for its simplicity, and computed the value to be minimized for selection as the Euclidean distance between a given stamp and the end point of the maze. We'll discuss that choice more later. Now we've completed the goal tree, which was the result of decomposing the challenges and problems posed by the specified problem statement. The maze input was decided to be an image with minimal constraints on the maze parameters, since graph representations would not be expected. As such, the path was defined to be a continuous set of pixels, and movement within the space is carried out using a step over and mark approach, with dynamic step sizes, and priority on rectilinear directionality, with steps being taken from the unsearched step nearest to the objective, and the objectives being identified by color coding using pixel-wise search of the maze. Building on all of this, for a very in-depth description of the algorithm, check out the video description. The algorithm is basically given in enough detail that you could follow along with the code on GitHub if you wanted to. To end the video, I want to share some more discussion on the lessons learned from this project. The first and most important felt like a huge slap in the face when I realized it. This was the epiphany that the entire stepwise movement strategy that the algorithm is built on is simply a means of converting a pixel-based representation of the maze into a graphical representation of the maze. I hope that this is obvious for any viewers given how I've been building a graph versus pixel context throughout this video, but it hit me all at once when I finally finished the project. When I first considered converting the pixel image to a graph to solve the problem, it didn't occur to me to make an imperfect approximation. It had seemed that creating the perfect, most efficient graphical representation would demand a tremendous amount of computational power, so as to be infeasible, but I didn't realize that an imperfect graphical approximation would also allow for finding the solution. As should be very apparent when watching the video of the final result, all that the step-based search algorithm is doing is that it is, one node at a time, building up a graphical representation of the entire maze from start to finish. It is imperfect since there are many, many filler nodes that would not have appeared in a perfect graphical representation, but nonetheless it is the same shape. Since the process only ends when the graph representation has reached the finish point of the maze, no graph search is necessary. The traceback suffices to identify the solution path. The power of the method, however, lies in the fact that after running only once, the graph that has been created can be saved and retained for future use to very, very rapidly find a path through the maze for any start and end points whatsoever using those graph search methods. I think it's best to abstract out this idea further to see connections to solving other problems. Fundamentally, what this realization did for me was that it drove home the power inherent in the idea of solving a problem by changing the form of its representation so as to apply different tools to it. For example, one commonly known mathematical expression for a circle is the equation x squared plus y squared equals 1. Applying this idea of the change of representation, we can instead use polar coordinates, which use the angle and length of a line to identify a point, instead of x and y coordinates. To describe the same circle in the polar coordinate system, all you need is r equals 1. 
those of us who've taken undergraduate physics courses know how using polar coordinates can make some problems so much more easy to solve because the representation is more simple. In another more tangible example, imagine the problem of communicating with somebody over a large distance. They're too far away for you to speak to them, no matter how loudly you yell, so the problem can't be solved in the current form. If instead you change your representation of the thing to be communicated, that is, speech, from sound itself to the more abstract idea of data, then it's obvious there are many solutions to the problem. You could convert your speech to radio waves using a walkie-talkie or phone to communicate it, or you could use a mirror to flash Morse code, or any other number of possibilities. Each of the alternative solutions has its own sub-problems, such as battery issues or inclement weather, but all it takes is one viable solution for the problem to be solved. Really, this strategy, changing the representation of a problem so as to apply tools to it that could not have been applied otherwise, is a powerful tool for all people to always have in mind, no matter what problem you're facing. Now to close this video, I'll share more on what I learned about the coding process itself. The primary thing is that I probably should have done an in-depth strategy assessment as I did in this video before going through with the project. Although it turned out alright, I did have to completely transform a few different areas of the code to enact a different strategy than I had had previously, which was a huge load of work, not only to make the new code, but to ensure it integrated properly with what had been made previously. So I would recommend seriously planning for any algorithm design and implementation. Here's a quick review of that planning process. The last thing I'll mention is that I failed to follow my own advice in making this program, and I suffered for it, specifically with the last item, making clean, distinct, and integratable functions to perform all the different subtasks. Doing so would have saved me a lot of trouble when integrating different parts of the program after making broad changes, and I highly recommend it. The program that I made is not the fastest or the most efficient, but I enjoyed making it and learned a lot too. I hope that you found this video as interesting and enjoyable as I did the process of making the program and that you feel encouraged to think abstractly about the problems you face in your school, business, or life. Thanks for watching and take care.